Well, in this diagram, we're looking at follicular development in more detail, from the primordial follicle through to the secondary follicle, all the way through to the mature uh, graphian follicle, just prior to uh, ovulation. Now, these primordial follicles actually develop when a baby girl is, is a fetus. Uh, they're detectable from about 20 weeks of gestation. But the, that actually says ovum in there. That should really be the oocyte to be more technically accurate. It becomes an ovum when it's mature. It's an oocyte when it's in an early stage of, uh, early stage of development. And actually these uh, oocytes in here, the immature ovum, are, are arrested in prophase of the first meiotic division. So the uh, oocytes in there, the immature ovum, are arrested in an early stage of meiosis. And we see that the oocyte is surrounded by a, a single layer of ovarian flattened uh, epithelial cells. Th these are called uh, granulosa cells that surround that. So th they'll just sit there for many years, not doing very much until they're stimulated by follicular stimulating hormone at puberty. But just out of interest in, in passing, it's interesting to note that it, um, at 20 weeks gestation, when these are first detected, there's uh, six to seven million of them. Uh, and then by the time birth comes along, there's only about 400,000 left. And they continue to degrade throughout childhood. So at puberty, there's about 40,000 left. And studies have shown at the age of 37, that's down to 25,000 typically. And by the age of 50, that's down to 1,000, which is, of course is why the menopause comes about because we run out of follicles. But anyway, getting back to um, puberty, the follicular stimulating hormone is going to cause the development of the uh, primary follicles into the secondary follicles and the mature follicles. And the FSH means there's probably a few of these around at any one time in the ovaries. They can take several months to develop. But by about day six in the menstrual cycle, one follicle becomes the dominant follicle. And oestrogen secreted by the dominant follicle will actually inhibit the release of follicular stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary gland. And that removes the uh, stimulus to the less well-developed uh, follicles. So one, hopefully one mature follicle will become what's called the graphian follicle. Now, of course, if there's co-dominant follicles, whether in the same ovary or, or another one in the, in the other ovary, and two are released, then they can be two ovum fertilized. And that will give rise to what we call dizygotic twins, the non-identical form of, of twins. And this grows to become quite large. This could be uh, 20 millimeters in diameter. Many uh, granulosa cells secreting the oestrogen. So the oestrogen is coming from the granulosa cells surrounding the follicle under the influence of follicular stimulating hormone. And it's this oestrogen which goes on to cause the development of the secondary sexual characteristics at puberty. So in childhood, the primordial follicles are there, but they're not stimulated by the follicular stimulating hormone, so they don't develop into the granulosa cells, so they don't produce the oestrogen. So a young girl will not have significant amounts of oestrogen in the blood. But when her follicles start to develop, the follicular granulosa cells will produce the oestrogen. And while we're looking at diagrams, we could consider this one of the, uh, the events that happen uh, after ovulation. So here we see that um, the ovum is released at the events of ovulation, which would ideally happen at about day 14 of the menstrual cycle. And within a few hours after that, under the influence of luteinizing hormone, so it's the luteinizing hormone that actually causes, it's the actual trigger of ovulation. So ev everything is prepared here by the follicular stimulating hormone to make the mature graphian follicle. But the actual final trigger that initiates the process of ovulation itself from the surface of the ovary is the rise in luteinizing hormone. And the luteinizing hormone will also make the granulosa cells change to these luteal cells. And as we see, it's these luteal cells that produce uh, progesterone, primarily progesterone. Now, before 
ovulation. The granulosa cells produce mostly oestrogen, but they will produce some progesterone. And it's the same after ovulation. The luteal cells will produce some oestrogen, but they produce mostly progesterone. Progesterone is important for the formation of the ductile structure and the milk secreting cells in the, in the breasts. And we also notice it maintains the development of the endometrium during the second half of the menstrual cycle. And actually the uh, corpus luteal cells produce uh, another hormone called relaxin. Relaxin is produced by the corpus luteal cells. And what the uh, relaxin will do is it will inhibit the contractions of the uterus. Because if fertilization does occur, we don't want contraction of the uh, uterus, which could result in a mis well, an early miscarriage, rejection of the, the fertilized zygote, and therefore failure of uh, impl implantation into the developed endometrium. Now you've probably noticed that puberty occurs in boys as well as girls. And here we have a picture of the testes. And it's interesting because this shows us the effects of the hormones as well. So at puberty, uh, testosterone and sperm production are stimulated under the influence of anterior pituitary gonadotrophins, just in the same way as the female's follicles are stimulated by the gonadotrophins. And these, of course, are the luteinizing hormone and the follicular stimulating hormone. So the anterior pituitary hormones in men are the same as those in women. But in men, it's the FSH that stimulates spermatogenesis. That's the formation of these. So the formation of the sperm in men is stimulated by the follicular stimulating hormone. And the luteinizing hormone stimulates testosterone secretion. So we see that in the testes, we have these uh, seminiferous tubules. These are going to be stimulated by the follicular stimulating hormone to produce the sperm, which are gonna go through this complicated system of ducts through the epididymis, and eventually out of this tube here, the vas deferens um, to take part in ejaculation. But we also notice that round about these tubules, there are interstitial cells, sometimes called the interstitial cells of Leydig. And these are the cells that are stimulated by the luteinizing hormone to produce testosterone that's secreted into the blood. In fact, these interstitial cells of Leydig secrete several androgens, the male type hormones but by far the most abundant one is the testosterone. So it's the arrival of the luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary that stimulates the production of the testosterone that initiates puberty. And at the same time, the arrival of the follicular stimulating hormone is going to stim stimulate spermatogenesis. And this all depends on the presence of the Y chromosome, of course, which gives rise to maleness. Because in fetal life, the Y chromosome causes the early genital tissue to produce testosterone. And if this stimulation from the Y chromosome, this stimulation of early testosterone from the Y chromosome does not occur, a baby girl will develop. So it's really true to say that in early fetal development, we were all female. But those of us that turned out to be male had the Y chromosome that stimulated the early production of testosterone. And it's this early fetal testosterone which causes the development of the, the penis, the prostate gland, the seminal vesicles, the, uh, the male genital ducts and scrotum, as well as other male body characteristics. But these remain somewhat dormant until there's this additional surge of testosterone occurring from the interstitial cells under the influence of luteinizing hormone. So from shortly after birth and, and throughout boyhood, the levels of testosterone in the blood remain very low. 
Uh, with puberty, testosterone stimulates the enlargement of the primary male sexual characteristics, which are the penis, testis and scrotum. And it also stimulates the development of male secondary sexual characteristics, which increase the differentiation between men and women. And interestingly, it's actually testosterone which causes the, uh, the testes to descend into the scrotum, um, hopefully in late uh, fetal life. So testosterone and these other androgen male type hormones are, are playing this important role in fetal life, in puberty and in later adult life. Although after the age of about 50 in men, testosterone levels do gradually start to reduce.